Hey y'all. Okay, so this is it for Tech Everlasting. This will be the last video for Tech Everlasting. No more Natalie Babbitt, no more Packet. And I have to admit, it kind of makes me sad because I love this story. I hope that you enjoyed this story too. Um, the way that it ended was kind of weird. It really left you hanging. You have no idea what ended up happening to the Tucks. You have no idea what ended up happening to um, Winnie or her family. So Natalie Babbitt did us a solid. And what she did was she wrote us an epilogue. And an epilogue, it has the same type of function of a prologue, just at the end of the book rather than at the beginning. So we talked about this. <clears throat> when we first started reading Tuck Everlasting. A prologue is not even the first chapter of the book. It's kind of like an introduction to the book. And a lot of times what the author will do is put in some foreshadowing. So remember, foreshadowing is when the author kind of drops some hints. Remember we did this? Plink, plink. Um, and Natalie Babbitt was plinking, doing some foreshadowing. And the reason that she did that was to kind of hook us so that we would be interested in reading the book and turning the page every time we read. Um, and I think that it worked. You know, in the prologue of Tuck Everlasting, it talked about three events happening, and it seemed like on the surface these three events had nothing to do with each other, when in fact they had everything to do with each other. Um, Winnie thinking about running away, May Tuck going to Tree Gap, and the man in the yellow suit looking for someone, but we didn't know who. Now that we're at the end, all of those things that she plinked at the beginning of the book with foreshadowing, now we know. We know what they all meant. We know um, how they were connected. And now we're left with this feeling of, okay, the book is over, but what happened? Did Winnie drink the water? Didn't she drink the water? Did she end up marrying J Jesse or did she not end up marrying Jesse? And where are the tucks? Do they end up living forever? Like what goes on? So the function of an epilogue is to give us information. So an epilogue is written by an author to give you a, here's what happens next. Typically, an epilogue is written in a format that would be days later, weeks later, months later, even years later. So it's kind of giving you information about these characters in the future. Um, so that's what our epilogue does. It revisits the Tux and Winnie Foster years later. So grab your book, turn to the epilogue at the end um, of Tuck Everlasting on page 134. There is no packet to do with the epilogue. But please, if you haven't already, make sure that your packet is completely filled out. If we do end up meeting each other again um, back at school, whether it's in April or May or whenever, I will be collecting this packet. If we don't meet each other again, um, like we end up doing this until the end of the year because nobody really knows what's going to happen, I won't be able to collect the packet, obviously, but you are going to be able to use this packet on your Tuck Everlasting final test. So hopefully that will help you. All right, here we go. Page 134, the epilogue. The sign said, welcome to Tree Gap, but it was hard to believe that this was really Tree Gap. The main street hadn't changed so very much, but there were many other streets now crossing the main street. The road itself was blacktopped. Now remember, up to this point, our setting is late 1700s, early 1800s. No cars, no radio, no television, definitely no cell phones. Um... The roads were actually trod out by cows. So it was the cows that kind of created the roads and they were dirt roads with some rocks on the side and that kind of thing, but not blacktop like we're used to today. So these roads are blacktopped. So that should tell you something about the change in the setting. Hmm, an epilogue that takes place maybe days later. Would it just be days that all of a sudden they would start blacktopping roads? Would it be weeks later, months later, or could it be years later? Think about that as we continue reading. May and Tuck on the seat of the clattering wooden wagon bumped slowly into Tree Gap behind the fat old horse. So the old horse is still around. May and Tuck are still around, and they're in a wagon. 
So that still kind of makes me think of uh, like an older time. They had seen continuous change and were accustomed to it, but here it seemed shocking and sad. Look, said Tuck, look, May, ain't that where the wood used to be? It's gone, not a stick or a stump left. And her cottage, that's gone too. It was very hard to recognize anything, but from the little hill, which had once lain outside the village and was now very much a part of it, they thought they could figure things out. Yes, said May. That's where it was, I do believe. Of course, it's been so long since we was here. I can't tell for certain. So what Tuck is saying is it looks like the wood is not there anymore and either is Winnie's house. So now go back to that original question. Is it days, weeks, months, or years that all of that kind of stuff would take place? There was a gas station there now. A gas station? What? Why would a horse need gas? Hmm. I don't think they would. So this really is another clue as to how much time has passed. A young man in greasy coveralls was polishing the windshield of a wide and rusty Hudson automobile. So now there are cars. As May and Tuck rolled past, the young man grinned and said to the driver of the Hudson, who lounged at the wheel, Well, looky there, in from the country for a big time. And they chuckled together. So I think what he means is it's not too often that they see people with um, wagons and horses anymore. So these must be country folk, like people who live out in the country who um, don't travel by automobile like probably most people do during this time. Do you think this is present day? Because it talks about there being a gas station and there's a boy who is polishing the windshield. So that means he's cleaning the windshield of the car and the driver's just sitting inside the car and this boy is probably pumping gas for the driver. So does that happen today? I don't think so. So this is not present day, but it's definitely a long time from where our story ended when May was rescued from the jailhouse. May and Tuck clattered onto, oh, oops, excuse me. May and Tuck clattered on into the village proper past a Catholic mixture of houses, which soon gave way to shops and other places of business. A hot dog stand, a dry cleaner, a pharmacy, a five and 10, another gas station, a tall white frame building with a pleasant veranda, the Tree Gap Hotel, family dining and easy rates, the post office, Beyond that, the jailhouse, but a larger jailhouse now, painted brown with an office for the county clerk. A black and white police car was parked in front with a red glass searchlight on its roof and a radio antenna like a buggy whip fastened to the windshield. May glanced at the jailhouse but looked away quickly. See beyond there, she said pointing, that diner? Let's stop there and get a cup of coffee, all right? All right, said Tuck. Maybe they'll know something. Inside, the diner gleamed with chrome and smelled like linoleum and ketchup. May and Tuck took seats on rumbling swivel stools at the long counter. The counterman emerged from the kitchen at, a, at the rear and sized them up expertly. They looked all right. A little queer, weird, maybe their clothes especially, but honest. He slapped a cardboard menu down in front of them and leaned on the foaming orangeade cooler. You folks from off? he asked. Yep, said Tuck, just passing through. Mm-hmm, sure, said the counterman. Say, said Tuck cautiously, fingering the menu, didn't there used to be a wood once down on the other side of town? Oh, sure, said the counterman. Had a big electrical storm, though, about three years ago now. Or thereabouts. Big tree got hit by lightning, split right down the middle, caught fire and everything. Tore up the ground, too. Had to bulldoze her all out. Oh, said Tuck. He and May exchanged glances. Coffee, please, said May. Black, for both of us. Sure, said the counterman. He took the menu away, poured coffee into thick pottery mugs, and leaned, against the, leaned again on the orangeade cooler. Used to be a freshwater spring in that wood, said Tuck boldly, sipping his coffee. 
Don't know anything about that, said the counterman. Had to bulldoze her all out, like I say. Oh, said Tuck. So what is Tuck really doing? I think trying to get information from this person to see if anyone actually knew about the spring or um, had seen the spring or this or the water was somewhere, but it sounds like he doesn't know anything. Afterward, while May was shopping for supplies, Tuck went back through the town on foot, back the way they had come, out to the little hill. There were houses there now and a feed and grain store, but on the far side of the hill, inside a rambling iron fence, was a cemetery. Tuck's heart quickened. He had noticed the cemetery on the way in. May had seen it too. They had not spoken about it, but both knew it might hold other answers. Tuck straightened his old jacket. He passed through an archway of wrought iron curly cues and paused, squinting at the weedy rows of gravestones. And then far over to the right, he saw a tall monument once no doubt imposing, but now tipped slightly sideways. On it was carved one name, Foster. Slowly Tuck turned his footsteps toward the monument and saw as he approached that there were other smaller markers all around it, a family plot. And then his throat closed, for it was there. He had wanted it to be there, but now that he saw it, he was overcome with sadness. He knelt and read the inscription. In loving memory, Winifred Foster Jackson. Dear wife, dear mother, 1870 to 1948. I need a minute. <clears throat> so <clears throat> here's what we know. Because there's a gravestone for Winnie, she did not drink the water. We also know that she did not end up with Jesse because her last name is Jackson. She did get married. It says, dear wife. She did have children. It says, dear mother. But it was not connected to the Tuck family. So Winnie didn't drink the water. She led out a normal life where she became a wife and mother, and she lived her life from 1870 to 1948. So, said Tuck to himself, two years. She's been gone two years. Okay, so if she passed away in 1948 and she's been gone two years, that means Tuck and May revisited Tree Gap, and it's 1950. <clears throat> He stood up and looked around, embarrassed, trying to clear the lump from his throat. But there was no one to see him. The cemetery was very quiet. In the branches of a willow behind him, a red-winged blackbird chirped. Tuck wiped his eyes hastily. Then he straightened his jacket again and drew up his hand in a brief salute. Good girl, he said aloud. And then he turned and left the cemetery, walking quickly. Later, as he and May rolled out of Tree Gap, May said softly without looking at him, She's gone. Tuck nodded. She's gone, he answered. There was a long moment of silence between them, and then May said, Poor Jesse. He knowed it, though, said Tuck. At least he knowed she wasn't coming. We all knowed that a long time ago. Well, just the same, said May. She sighed. And then she sat up a little straighter. Well, where to now, Tuck? No need to come back here no more. Yep, that's so, said Tuck. Let's just head on out this way. We'll locate something. All right, said May. And then she put a hand on his arm and pointed. <gasps> Look out for that toad! Tuck had seen it, too. He reined in the horse and climbed down from the wagon. The toad was squatting in the middle of the road, quite unconcerned. In the other lane, a pickup truck rattled by. And against the breeze it made, the toad shut its eyes tightly, but it did not move. Tuck waited till the truck had passed, and then he picked up the toad and carried it to the weeds along the road's edge. Oh, darn full thing must think it's going to live forever, he said to May. And soon they were rolling on again, leaving Tree Gap behind, and as they went, the tinkling little melody of a music box drifted out behind them and was lost at last far down the road. The, 
that toad. This line, the darn fool thing must think it's going to live forever. What kind of toad would think it's going to live forever? Maybe the kind that Winnie gives water to? Yeah. All right, guys, that's it. The end. Tuck Everlasting is over. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I am posting the test today. You do not have to take the test today. It is due by Friday. So the test needs to be completed sometime between today and Friday. It is open book. It is open note. So you can use your binder and your packet. All right. Hugs. See you later.